Hi everyone, my name is Megan. I'm a registered dietitian at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm so excited to be here with you today to talk a little bit about enterocutaneous fistulas. So to begin, I wanna start off with the basics of what a fistula is. By definition, a fistula is an abnormal connection or passageway that connects two body parts, organs, or vessels. And the nomenclature is based on the two areas that are connected. So for example, if we have a patient who has a tracheoesophageal fistula, then that's telling us that the communication is between the trachea and the esophagus. So for the purpose of today's video, we're going to um, focus specifically on enterocutaneous fistulas, otherwise known or referred to as ECFs. So when we hear the term enterocutaneous fistula, we should understand that there is an abnormal connection between the GI tract and the skin, which you can see here in this photo. Um, this pathway results in leakage of intestinal or stomach contents out of the skin. ECFs are typically a complication after abdominal surgery or injury, um, but they may also develop spontaneously. Common causes include inflammatory bowel disease, more specifically Crohn's disease, diverticular disease, perforated ulcers, trauma, GI malignancy, and oncologic surgery. ECFs can be categorized as low, moderate, or high output. Low output indicates that the fistula is putting out less than 200 milliliters per day. Moderate output indicates that it's putting out anywhere from 200 to 500 milliliters per day, while high output is telling us that there's more than 500 milliliters out of that fistula per day. Drainage may vary in color and consistency, depending on the original location of the fistula, and pouching systems or ostomy appliances are often utilized to collect the affluent losses. Now, wound care is an entirely different topic, um, but it is important to note that ECF patients require close follow-up with many other team members, including wound care specialists. The skin surrounding the fistula can break down from the nature of the drainage and the constant presence of moisture on the skin. So a management technique to heal and prevent further damage is crucial to recovery for these patients. Medications also play a major role in managing fistula output. Different medications, including antidiarrheals such as loperamide, codeine, opium tincture, there's proton pump inhibitors, and somatostatin analogs such as octreotide that are utilized to decrease GI secretions and prolong intestinal transit time. High output fistulas are the most nutritionally concerning. Copious drainage of intestinal fluids results in significant losses of electrolytes, minerals, protein, and fluids, which can then potentially lead to dehydration, malnutrition, and electrolyte imbalances. The goal is to provide estimated nutrient requirements and maintain fluid and electrolyte balance to promote that spontaneous closure. Now let's talk about macronutrients. ECF patients have increased energy requirements given the need for wound healing and in the setting of persistent inflammation. Based on the aspen Philanthi clinical guidelines for ECFs, observational studies report goal energy doses of 25 to 30 kcals per kilogram per day. However, if a patient is experiencing high output, 1.5 to two times the basal energy expenditure is often required for these patients. Now, I wanna know if a patient's weight is impairing pouching or healing of the skin in any way, then the goal should be to um, promote gradual weight loss while still providing adequate protein. Now, increased protein needs are warranted as well. Um, the general range is about 1.5 to two grams per kilogram per day. But again, this varies based on affluent losses in the location of the fistula itself. Um, patients with high output ECFs may require upwards of 2.5 grams per kilogram of protein per day, whereas 1.5 gram per kilogram is often utilized to maintain positive nitrogen balance in low output ECF patients. Now, moving on to fluid and electrolyte concerns, as I mentioned before, one of the main goals um, and first course of actions for these patients is fluid resuscitation and electrolyte stabilization even prior to optimizing nutrition. We wanna maintain the positive fluid balance to prevent dehydration. Now, the location of the ECF is key to better understand fluid and electrolyte alterations. So I do wanna briefly discuss two common medical terms that are used to describe a fistula's location. And those terms are proximal and distal. I'll be using these terms a lot in the coming section. So I just wanna make sure that you understand um, what I'm referring to. 
A proximal ECF indicates that the fistula is closer to the center of the body or higher up along the GI tract, whereas a distal fistula implies that the fistula is away from the center of the body um, or further down the GI tract. So when thinking about these locations, a proximal ECF will have higher fluid and electrolyte losses as there's less opportunity for the body to absorb what is taken in. These types of fistulas are similar to short gut syndrome um, in that the gut proximal to the fistula is basically short with minimal absorptive capacity. Now, patients with high output are at a higher risk for electrolyte imbalances, specifically sodium, potassium, magnesium, and bicarbonate, or even chloride if there's a gastric fistula involved. Daily labs should be monitored and electrolytes should be repleted as needed. Oral rehydration solutions are often encouraged to aid in hydration. And there's even a process known as refeeding entroclysis, where proximal fistula drainage is reinfused via the distal limb to replete any losses. And with successful implementation of this technique, Adequate balance of fluid, electrolytes, and nutrition can be achieved, oftentimes removing the need for parental nutrition support. In terms of micronutrients, ECF patients are at higher risk for deficiencies, but the location of the fistula should be the focus of the specific deficiencies. Remember, the fistula location alters the site of absorption, and referring back to your knowledge of where individual micronutrients absorb is very important. High output ECFs often require empiric zinc copper, selenium, and vitamin C to support wound healing. Close monitoring of vitamin and mineral levels are recommended, but please be aware that most levels are affected by the acute phase response. We want to replete any confirmed deficiencies with standard repletion guidelines and then recheck the levels following supplementation to ensure that we've adequately um, repleted these patients. Now let's explore feeding methods. Understanding the origin of the fistula and the patient's anatomy um, is what we want to understand. Um, it's essential when providing recommendations regarding the feeding route. So some questions that we want to understand are, what is the origin of the fistula? Is it higher up along the GI tract, such as the duodenal or jejunal fistula, or lower along the GI tract, say in the distal ileum or in the colon? Um, if the origin of the fistula is colonic, then we can potentially feed this patient orally or via a gastric tube, assuming that there's adequate um, healthy proximal bowel for successful absorption. Another question we want to understand is, does the patient have any obstruction proximal or distal to that fistula or any other GI issues that would contraindicate enteral feeds? If a patient has an obstruction below the origin of the fistula, then we should not be attempting to feed this patient below their fistula. Further questions may include how much healthy bowel is available, is there enough surface area available for adequate nutrient absorption, what's the likelihood of spontaneous closure, and how much output is the patient having prior to and following initiation of enteral feeding. Another example when enteral feeding may be appropriate is a proximal fistula that has adequate distal healthy bowel for proper absorption below the fistula. In this case, a feeding tube should be placed with the tip of the feeding tube past the location of the fistula and tube feed should be initiated. For fistulas that are not expected to close um, or heal without surgery, a process known as fistula glysis can be utilized um, depending on the, the location of the fistula. Fistula clysis is a technique um, of using the fistula as access to the GI tract, so actually placing a feeding tube directly into the fistula opening um, and infusing nutrition, formula, and even the gastrointestinal secretions down the distal limb of the fistula. So in simpler terms, what we often may hear this called is feeding the fistula. Um, for patients experiencing high fistula output, we often see immediate orders for NPO, bowel rest, and TPN. And TPN is often utilized in an attempt to reduce that fistula output, which then allows the surrounding tissues to heal and the skin to heal. But it also is used to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance. Um, First line TPN is a common misconception as there can be patients with high output that are managed well. So the patient has, there's adequate pouching, there's adequate wound care um, and fluid and electrolyte balance while also taking an oral diet or tube feeds. 
the key here is to monitor for changes to output or the manageability of the output with the initiation of feeds or the increase to tube feeds. Every effort should be made to feed these patients enterally um, and utilize the gut when appropriate. Now for patients with low output, we often see these patients ordered for a regular or fiber restricted diet. We should be encouraging high calorie and protein rich foods with oral nutrition supplements as needed. Um, and then if intake proves inadequate, then we can use supplemental enteral nutrition via feeding tube um, if the patient has a functional GI tract. And again, um, the ECF output should be closely monitored for any changes with initiation of the feeding. So in summary, patients with ECFs require an individualized nutrition plan focusing on fluid and electrolyte stabilization, along with optimal provisions of micronutrients and macronutrients. Close follow-up with many interdisciplinary team members is crucial to best support the wound healing and spontaneous closure. And then if the fistula doesn't close on its own, a complex surgery is often required for closure and to reconnect the GI tract. To read more specifics regarding nutritional management and recommendations for ECFs, please see the Aspen and Philanthi Clinical Guidelines, Nutrition Support of Adult Patients with Entropetaneous Fistula. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I hope this video was helpful for you. Um, if you have any questions, please put them below um, and please subscribe to our channel for more educational videos regarding nutrition support. Thanks. Mm -hmm.